All right, so what we're going to look at here today is the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. You can use those two terms interchangeably for this class, although I would say that in reality they are not necessarily identically the same, but I'll explain that as we go on. But for American history, we're going to talk about the French and Indian War. Okay? And uh, in fact, it actually started more in 1754, but make it coincide with the Seven Years' War. We're going to say from 1756 to 1763. Okay? This will be the first war we're going to talk about in American history. Okay? And it's going to directly lead into the causes of the next one, which of course is the American Revolution. That's going to be kind of the main thing we're going to talk about. How did this event create conditions that will eventually lead to American independence? So that's going to be kind of the the main thing we're going to be looking at here when we get to the end of it. All right? Okay, let's start off with this background. So, first thing I want to talk about is what was the status of North America in the 1750s, which is, of course, when the war is going to break out. All right, so this map here shows you <clears throat> who were the major European powers that were at play in the Americas, okay? Uh, you see down here we had Spanish, which we talked about a few weeks ago, okay? We have the French here in the Louisiana Territory, as well up here in New France, which is modern-day Canada. And then, of course, we had the British on the East Coast, the original 13 colonies, which we learned about, and, of course, up here also in Canada. Okay? Now, this was the situation in the 1750s. However, the biggest concern regarding American colonial claims was right here in this disputed territory. See that shaded red and yellow right there? It's a disputed. Okay, that is where we need to start our focus, right? That territory right there, located along the Ohio River, which is this river right there, was known as the Ohio River Valley. Okay, the Ohio River Valley. And the reason why it's shaded that way is because that area was disputed territory. And what that means is it was being claimed by two different countries. It was being claimed by both England, who claimed that they had the rights to it by virtue of their expedition, and of course also by the French. And this was made even more problematic by the fact that England and France were historic rivals. They didn't like each other very much. So this created the potential for a conflict over that, since both sides were saying, hey, it's ours. Okay, and neither side was willing to give up their claims to their rival. All right. So inevitably, we will have a battle for this territory, and that battle will eventually expand into a all-out war, and eventually it'll become a world war, okay? But throughout the, the 1750s, what we saw was both the English and French began sending forces into the disputed territory, the Ohio River Valley, in an attempt to secure it, okay? And what uh, the most important thing was, as you can see here, the French began to build a series of forts down into the region, Okay, just stop the airplane. And if you look here on a collision course with those French forts, was a series of British forts. Okay, you can see the French were coming down from the north. You have the British coming in from the east. Okay, so it was pretty much guaranteed that at some point there was going to be a conflict between the British and the French over control over this region. This region was particularly desirable because it was a very fertile area that would be uh, home to good farming. So the land there was uh, incredibly valuable. That's one of the reasons why there was so much you know, focus and effort to control the area. So as I said before, inevitably we will get a clash. Okay, and in 1754 we get that first clash. And uh, famously, this is kind of a neat thing I think, uh, the person on the British side who was partly responsible for this first clash between uh, British and French forces was a young George Washington, right? George Washington, who would later go on to become the first president of the United States. Okay, he first plays an important role in history and gains, you know, name recognition for being uh, in command of a British expedition in the Ohio River Valley that uh, has a skirmish with French forces there. Okay, and in many ways, the shots fired between the British and French. In this conflict, uh, you know, this is what begins the fighting, which will eventually become the French Indian War and even bigger, the Seven Years' War, which is a world war. So in many ways, the Seven Years' War, which is going to be one of the greatest wars the world had ever seen up to this point, begins actually right here in our own backyard 
And uh, George Washington is kind of partly responsible for it, which is kind of interesting to think that you know, it must have been a smaller world back then for these people to play such an important role. Okay. Now, this first skirmish doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, the French do win, ultimately. They do force the British out of the Ohio River Valley. Uh, George Washington gets his first taste of war, and uh, his experiences will later on kind of lead to him uh, having command uh, down the road. All right. But this is the kind of this, this event is what kind of sets off the tensions between the British and the French, which will eventually lead to a all-out war. Okay. Now the conflict between the French and the English now caused concern for the English colonies, right? Because of course the most immediate threat to the English colonies, of course, the French presence and its encroaching into their territory. So in 1754, after this first kind of uh, you know battle we see an event called the Albany Congress. This is really important. It's not really, I'd say, well known to the general populace, but it's very important in this class. Okay, This is actually one of the most important things we're going to cover here today. Uh, also a very highly tested concept on the exam. So let's talk about what this was. So the Albany Congress of 1754 was a meeting of colonial leaders to discuss what to do, basically, about the now war with the French that was kind of beginning to start. Okay? And he would say, well, what's so important about that, right? What, what does it matter? Okay? Well, it was pretty important, as this cartoon here shows. And this cartoon is most, most people associate this cartoon with the American Revolution. You might have seen this cartoon before. It's pretty famous. It was actually uh, created by Ben Franklin, who was a leader in uh, Pennsylvania, of course, one of our founding fathers. But uh, though it's most associated with the American Revolution, actually it was first created to encourage uh, colonial leaders to attend the Albany Congress. Okay, the message, join or die, right? I mean, it's pretty serious. So what was Ben Franklin talking about here? Well, you have to understand the nature of the colonies at the time, right? So this is the important thing to understand. In 1754, there was no <clears throat> unified colonial government, right? The colonies, the 13 colonies that we talked about last week, basically, in many ways, were like 13 independent countries. <clears throat> they all had their own elected governments, they had their own you know, economies, they had their own interests, and there was no unifying governmental structure that kind of bonded them all together. All right? So, because of that, in a war, which we're going to see here shortly, uh, you know, the fact that there was no you know, unified structure of government meant that the colonies in a war would be in bad shape because, of course, in a war, you need to have some kind of unified structure so you can give commands and get organized and things like that. So the Albany Congress of 1754 was one of the very first, this is why it's important more than anything, it was one of the very first attempts at colonial unity. It was one of the first times that colonial leaders were like, hey, maybe we ought to get together and meet and talk about working together instead of as you know, 13 independent parts. Let's all work together as the British American colonies. That idea of colonial unity was unknown at the time. So it, this is a very important moment in American history because it was the first time we actually saw that concept appear. Now, why does that matter? Well, not only is it important in winning the French and Indian War, but later down the road, the colonies are going to need to work together against, of course, the British to win their independence. And it's, you know, some of the relationships and the organization created the Albany Congress, which will eventually lead to future colonial unity and things like the Continental Congress, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. So anyways, this is a very important moment. Now, they didn't just talk about colonial unity. They talked about a lot of these. They also talked about getting the Indians to fight on their side. Because, you know, the French had their Indian allies, which is why it's called the French Indian War, because we were fighting against the French and their Indian allies. But the British also wanted to buy off some Indian allies of their own. All right, so the main two discussion points at the Albany Congress were, one, colonial unity against the common French threat, and two, maintaining Indian allies. Now, was this successful? Well, somewhat. You know, there was some commitment to colonial unity. However, some colonies were more reluctant than others to submit to that. And you have to understand, because you know, how committed they were to the war depended on where they were located. You know, some colonies were far away from the fighting. They're like, not our problem. Right? Which kind of just shows you the independent nature of the colonies. Whereas the colonies that were more closely, you know, close in proximity to the fighting, they were more concerned. They were more eager to get together. So there's still going to be some growing pains when it comes to colonial unity. But this is the first kind of step we see towards the colonies working together against a common threat. 
keep that in mind. That is really important and will become more important tomorrow when we talk about the beginnings of the American Revolution. Questions on this before I move on? Really important you know this. All right. So shortly after that first skirmish with George Washington, we see tensions between the English and French begin to grow, and we see now increasing you know, conflict in the Ohio River Valley and even abroad in Europe. Okay? So ultimately, the fight over the Ohio River Valley will lead to full-scale war between England and France. Okay? And though the fighting begins in America, which is kind of neat to think about in world history, it eventually will spread to much of the world. Okay? Now, early on in the war in the Americas, uh, things were not going good for the colonists and their British allies. The British did send soldiers over to help defend the colonies. Okay? But in one of the first major battles of the war, okay, the commander of British forces, this guy named General Braddock, was actually killed. Okay? And the British soldiers were kind of run from the battlefield. And one of the, the challenges the British had was, you know, how to defeat the French. The French were using you know, the Indians as their allies, and the Indians are using these unorthodox guerrilla tactics, which means unconventional, guerrilla warfare is unconventional. And the British soldiers were not used to this. And, you know, in Europe, they were fighting on the open battlefield, they were fighting in rank and file. That's how people fought in those days. In the Americas, it was very different, because we were fighting in the dense woods and, you know, against these, these Indians who didn't have these tactics. So early on, the American colonists <clears throat> and the British soldiers, they struggle. And if you look at, it, really, the first part of the war, you would maybe say that, on, at least on the American front, they were losing. The French were winning. So something's going to have to eventually change in order for you know, them to, to have victory. But early on, the loss of Braddock and, of course, other defeats meant uh, the Americans were not really having a good time with this. Now, as I said before, the war may start in America, but before long, it began to encompass most of Europe. Okay? So... In many ways, the French and Indian War starts in 1754. But by 1756, much of Europe was now at war in what will become known as the Seven Years' War. So that's why you've got to know the two terms, because while they're not identical conflicts, it's more like the French and Indian War was just a particular front of the Seven Years' War. Okay? But for American history, the term that's most commonly used is the French and Indian War, because for our perspective, what mattered? The French and the Indians, they were our enemies, right? But if you were living in Europe at the time, this was just an afterthought. The real fighting of this war, the Seven Years' War, is going to take place in Europe. In Europe, we're going to have major battles in which tens of thousands of people are going to die. Okay? And those battles are actually going to dictate who wins this war. Okay? So while we were concerned with what was going on in our own backyard, and rightfully so, this war, the, you know, the, the real battles that are actually going to determine the outcome are going to be taking place in Europe, between the British and their allies, and the French and their allies. And Justin, you don't have to know all this for this class, but you can see here, the British uh, and their allies are the ones marked in yellow, and then of course the French and their allies are marked in blue. And you can see it says main areas of fighting. Most of the main areas of fighting, which is the shade area, is going to be located right here in Central Europe. However, I'd like to point out, you see a little shading right here in America, and what region is that? Or our valleys. So that's where the main areas of fighting were, at least in the American front of the war. But this is really where the action was. Okay? And, uh, you know, we were just an afterthought. Both sides, British and French, they didn't send a lot of forces over to America because they didn't really care. They were more worried about at home where the real threat was. Okay? France was worried about, you know, being invaded. So that, that you know, the Americas were an afterthought. All right. Now, over the course of the fighting, okay, over the course of the Seven Years' War, the French Indian War, whatever you want to call it, we actually saw tensions grow between the American colonists and their fellow British allies. Okay? Which seems odd because we were British too, right? Weren't the American colonists British? Yes, they were. Right? But what we were learning was, over the course of the war, is that though the American colonists were British citizens, they were different. Okay? Uh, living for over 100 years in America, out in the wilderness, had made us unique. We were different. We were not like our British counterparts that lived, you know, were born and raised in Britain. And no more was this really apparent than in the military. Okay? And, for example, when the British military came over to assist the colonists in the fighting, 
the American militia, our soldiers, were kind of shocked at some of the behavior of the, the British regular soldiers, the red coats as they were called. Okay? For example, the tactic of fighting in the open battlefield in open lines and rank and file that was custom, customary to Europe made American colonists were like, that ain't gonna work here, guys. You know, the Indians don't fight that way. They hide behind trees and they take shots at you and they ambush you and they retreat. You know, you've got to adapt. And the colonists thought that the British way of fighting was, in a way, stupid. Okay? However, the British military looked at the American colonists who used to adopt these more Indian grill attacks and were like, that's cowardly. That's not how you fight. You fight in the open battlefield. You meet your, your enemy face to face. Okay? So they had different opinions about tactics, but even more so, it was the contempt that the British officers had for our military. You know, the British officers, many of them came from well-to-do families. They were, you know, from, you know, uh, kind of gentlemen officers who, who were, you know, came from, you know, famous families and bloodlines and all that. And they had all of the kind of pomp and circumstance that comes with that, right? So, for example, a lot of the generals that would travel with an entourage with their own private tent, where, with their own fine china where they'd have tea time. And in our times, we're like, what's this all about? Like, you know, we've been living out in the woods for 100 years. We didn't have all that refinement. And that may not seem like a big deal, but it kind of exposed the differences between, you know, those who were born in England and those who were born in the American colonies. And, but it wasn't just feelings. It was actual practical discrimination. For example, American colonial militia officers were not granted the same respect and rank in the official British Army. So, for example, uh, if an officer in the colonial militia was like a colonel or something, which was a very high-ranking uh, position, they might be only credited with being, say, a captain or a lieutenant, which is a lower-ranking uh, officer position in the British Army. Okay, So even our own officers were being treated with disdain. Now, even though we were on the same side, the British military kind of looked down on our colonial militia, and of course vice versa. So one of the things they say about the French Indian War was it, it started to kind of expose the differences between the American colonists and, of course, our British-born counterparts, which is going to eventually lead to all kinds of problems later on. We were on the same side, but once again, we didn't see eye to eye on everything. Now, how about the course of the war? I'm not going to talk much about this because it's really not that important for us in this class. Okay? But the war eventually, the tide for the war eventually does turn for England starting in the you know, late war in the 1760s, okay? Now you can see that I did note that by 1761, Spain actually become an ally of France. He said, well, well, that's not good for England, you know, maybe that's, that'll you know, do them in, but that wasn't the case, okay? The reason why England starts to turn the tide of war by the 1760s is a couple things. One is they adopt some more aggressive tactics here in the American colonies. They began to lead attacks and expeditions into French territory, particularly up in what is uh, modern Canada. But the main reason the tide turns for England is because of battlefield victories back home in Europe. In Europe, there were massive battles going on, and the British and their Prussian allies, mainly Prussia was really getting it done for the British, they were defeating the French and their allies in these massive battles. And as a result, the French were not able to dedicate as many resources to the fight in America as they would like. Okay, the American front became an afterthought for the French, which allowed also the Americans and the British and, Ameri and, the, and the American colonies to now begin significantly making uh, gains there. All right. So long story short, by the 1760s, it was clear the war was now turning in favor of the British and their allies. Which means by 1763, the war had come to an end. Now, I have a lot of details up there. You don't necessarily have to write all this down, but I just want you to have a kind of a general idea of who the winners and losers were. All right. So the Seven Years' War comes to an end in 1763 with what's called the Treaty of Paris. Now, the Treaty of Paris is always interesting um, because there are many treaties of Paris. All right? And the only way we can distinguish them is by year. So you've got to be careful with that term. You do need to know the Treaty of Paris, but you do also need to be aware that we're going to be talking about several different treaties of Paris throughout the year. So Try not to get them confused. So the best way to do that is to always tag the year. So the Treaty of Paris of 1763 is the treaty that ends the Seven Years' War. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go through each one of these claims, but I do want you to have kind of a big picture idea of what happened. 
So the main change, if I had to know any change about this war in terms of who got what, I would know this. Okay, France was the big loser in this war in terms of, you know, land in the Americas. Okay, France pretty much lost almost the entirety of its American possessions. Look at this map over here. In this map, red represents French claims. So it's like, where's Waldo? Where's France? Can anyone find the red? <coughs> what? Yeah, down here in the Caribbean, right? What they call it Saint Dominique, which will eventually also France will lose later on to a revolution. But anyways, France has been almost completely expelled from the entire region. Now they will make a comeback. Some of you might think, well, I know from history that later on, you know, France sells Louisiana to the United States. Some of you might know that Napoleon does that, right? Maybe you didn't know that. So how can that be? Because look at the, at the map. Louisiana now belongs to Spain. Spain gained control of it. Okay, that's because France will make a comeback in a big way during the Napoleonic years. All right, we'll talk about that briefly in a few weeks. But for the time being, France has been eliminated from North America, which is a big deal. Spain, on the other hand, despite being on the losing side, it's kind of crazy, because Spain came to France's aid, they actually are rewarded with territory. So Spain gains the Louisiana territory, which is all the land uh, west of the Mississippi River. Keep that in mind. That's important for later as well. England, of course, is a winner. <clears throat> as a result, is rewarded. England does gain control over the Ohio River Valley, right here. And they also gain control over New France up in modern-day Canada. Now, what are all the French people up there? Do they just leave? No, they don't leave. They stay, right? Which, of course, is why today there is a legacy in Canada of both uh, you know, English-speaking and, of course, French-speaking people. It goes back hundreds of years to this time period. So Canada will become an English territory, okay? Um, but the French people there will stay, which creates an interesting uh, situation that still exists. Okay? So England receives all this land. They also get exclusive rights to slave trade and commercial dominance in India, which is less important for our class. But the big story here is France has been defeated. They have been expelled. England now dominates much of North America along with Spain. Okay? So to make this even more clear, here is the before map. I showed you this at the beginning class. Uh, here's the aftermath. Significant changes, right? The colors have changed. And of course, the most notable is all that red is gone. And it's now just a little bit down here. Okay? So then, of course, this is going to be animosity and resentment. France is not happy. And France is going to be considering revenge. You've got to keep that in mind as well. And okay, that's going to play an important role in the American Revolution as well. Because when we're looking for allies against the English, we've got France who's over there still seething over their defeat. And they're like, okay, we'll help you. So keep that in mind. It's all is interrelated. But anyways, this is the aftermath. Okay? Now the question is, well, what are the cons going to do with that? We're going to get to that in a second. Now, the other aftermath that isn't geographic is much bigger picture stuff with economics and, and, and uh, kind of social uh, ideas. So what was the effect of war on Britain? Well, one, and I just went over this, it increased the colonial empire in the Americas. More land to govern, which is going to be important here in a second. More land, but that brings more headaches, how to govern that land, especially when it's home to thousands of French people. How do we govern that? Okay, we've got to consider that. Uh, two, if I were you, I would underline this or start or highlight, do whatever you've got to do. This is really important. This is the one thing to remember from this slide, if anything. It greatly enlarged England's debt. The Seven Years' War was the most expensive war in Britain's history up to this point. It's important to note that it was a world war. Before the world wars, you had the Seven Years' War. It was a big one. The wars just keep getting bigger as we go through history. This is, but up to this point, this is one of the biggest wars in all of world history. And wars are expensive. Okay, And uh, England's going to have to deal with that. They went into great debt to win this war. And they're going to have to consider now how do we find new sources of revenue to pay for that debt. So keep that in mind. And lastly, as I already mentioned, during the war, 
feelings of content were expressed by the British and their officers uh, about the colonials. It wasn't just about the military. It wasn't just about the differences in between their leadership. It was everything. You know, even back home in Britain, there was a feeling in Parliament that the, the American colonists were not pulling their weight because some colonies were more committed to the fight than others. You know, down in Georgia, the colonists there really could have cared less about the fight because it was so remote and they're like, what do we care? So were they really going to devote a lot of manpower and resources to the fight? No. So, the, the, you know, back in Parliament, there was this belief that the American colonies were like these spoiled children and they were not doing everything in their power for the greater cause for the British Empire. And to some extent that is true. So there was feelings of contempt both about the way that the colonists you know, treated the war and the way the military acted, and that feeling of contempt is going to be shown in some of the policies that are to come. All right? So altogether, what this means is, because of increased empire, because of increased debt, because of these feelings of contempt, England is going to reevaluate how it runs its colonies. They're like, look, things have changed now. We need to think about how we do things, and things are going to have to change. Okay, so they now consider a major reorganization of the American Empire. All right, and that reorganization is not going to be very popular with the American colonists. And we're going to get to that here shortly. All right, so for all those reasons. Now, this is how the war affected Britain. Okay, we also need to look at how the war more specifically affected the American colonists because. Uh, they are going to react as well. Okay. So effects of the war on the American colonials. All right. Number one, it united us against a common enemy for the first time. It forced the colonies to work together against the threat of the French and their Indian allies. Okay. So this created a socializing experience for all those involved. You know, it created. Uh, lines of communication between the colonies and important colonial leaders. Okay, and those relationships will uh, become more important going into the uh, Revolutionary War period. But the idea that we could bond together, even though we were independent colonies, bond together, work together to defeat a superior enemy in many ways, or a common enemy, uh, that's important. It gives us confidence, right, that we can do it. And, uh, you know, when we eventually do declare our independence against Britain and go to war, there's a belief that we can bond together and fight against a common enemy. So we'll have to consider that here shortly. And that last point there, kind of the flip side of what we talked about on the previous slide, is it created bitter feelings for the British. You know, the treatment that the American colonists experienced at the hand of the British officers, you know, how they felt they had been disrespected and things like that, uh, they're going to remember that. And also, this is kind of a side point, but once again, it gives us confidence that the British can be beaten. You know, a lot of the American soldiers who fought in the French Indian War, you know, they'll remember how the British struggled to deal with the French and Indians in the early part of the war. They'll remember how the so-called invincible British Army had been scattered by guerrilla warfare tactics. And they're going to hold on to that memory, and when it comes time to fight the British ourselves, we're going to, you know, use that as a valuable lesson. This is how you defeat the British Army. Okay, they'll remember that. So that's important as well as we go towards the American Revolution. All right, now let's just finish up. Um, one of the other effects of the French and Indian War is what happened along the frontier. Now remember, the French and Indian War was originally, in many ways, begun for control over the Ohio River Valley. Okay, the colonists had won. The Ohio River Valley was theirs. And they wanted it. So immediately following the French and Indian War, American colonists now began to flood into the Ohio River Valley. Now here's the problem. The French had surrendered and left. But the Indians had it. Where are the Indians going to go? This was their land. So even though the French surrendered, called it a day, the Indians now were left without their prominent ally, but they were left to not fight on their own. And they were not going anywhere. They were going to fight for their land. So as British settlers, American colonists, settlers, began to flood the Ohio River Valley, they began to now spark conflicts with the Indians there. All right? Now, there was a lot of conflicts, but the, 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 the collective term that is usually referred to a lot of these was Pontiac's War. Immediately following the end of the French Indian War, we had a war with the Indians known as Pontiac's War. 
Okay, just that's just an example. I want you to know Pontiac's War was a war between the colonists and the Indians there. So no sooner had the war with France ended that we have another war, smaller war, but a war nonetheless. Now this is also important because the British, the British government, Parliament is not too happy about this situation. Parliament's like, look, we just got done fighting a massive war, the most expensive war in our history. Okay, we need to take a break from war for a while and figure out our finances. They didn't need the colonists going out and starting another war with the Indians that would be costly and require more troops to go to the colonies to protect them. So Parliament is very upset that these colonists are starting another war so soon after the French and Indian War. So this is where Parliament decides to act. Okay? So what Parliament does is in 1763, Parliament comes in and says, all right, we're going to create what they call the Proclamation Line. The Proclamation Line of 1763, which on this map is this green line right here that runs right through the Appalachian Mountains. And Parliament said, all right, no colonial settlement west of the Proclamation Line. They drew a line that says, don't cross this line because we don't want you starting trouble with the Indians. Okay? Now, Parliament was you know, whatever, thousands of miles away across the Atlantic, okay? The American colonists were here. And the American colonists resented this because they said, look, we just fought a war, gave our lives to take this territory, and now you're going to come in and say, don't take it? What was the point of the war? Right? Because the cause of the war was all about their own territory. Now, they, you know, they weren't concerned with the rest of what was going on in Europe. They weren't concerned about their immediate little world. For a British Parliament, it was about the bigger picture. But for the colonists being told that they can't take this land in the Ohio River Valley, well, look, here's the Ohio River Valley right here. Look at it. It's on the wrong side of the line. They're saying you can't take what you just fought for. The colonists didn't like that. So Parliament draws a line. What do the colonists do? There you go. Where's the line? There's the line. Oh, too bad. All right, what are you going to do? Right, you're across the Atlantic. That's weeks and weeks of sailing away. You can't stop us. We're out here on this you know, in our own little world. So the colonists just ignore the line. They just go right across. And of course, what do they do? They start fighting with the Indians and creates wars and all kinds of problems. Okay? So Parliament's going to look at this and go, these colonists are out of control. You know, they didn't pull their weight in the war. Now that the war's over, they're, they're just completely disobeying imperial orders. You can't do that. All right? So the feelings of contempt the Parliament had enough for the colonists are only going to intensify going into the post-war period. And Parliament and the Crown is going to say, okay, we've got to get these colonists in line. They're out of control. They're behaving like spoiled children. So they're going to now begin to crack down on the colonists. And that's going to cause all kinds of problems that are going to eventually lead to the American Revolution.